This is a production of World Video Bible School. To God be the glory. There seems to be an infatuation in recent years with the concept of the end of time. You turn on the television and you hear preachers talking about the signs of the times. And they'll point to events in the news that they say indicate the end is near. And they'll tell you that the Bible teaches this. In 1999, there was quite a ruckus made by end time preachers who were telling us that at the stroke of midnight in the year 2000, they said chaos would ensue and it would mark the beginning of the end. In recent years, the religious broadcaster Harold Camping predicted that on May 21st, 2000, he said that would mark the beginning of the end. And he broadcasted this message over 150 radio outlets, on the internet, on Facebook, on billboards, and even more recently, there's a new movie out starring Nicolas Cage. The movie is called Left Behind. It's based on the best-selling novel by the same name, written by Tim LaHaye and Jerry B. Jenkins, and it's produced by Willie Robertson from Duck Dynasty. But it depicts one man's opinion of what will supposedly happen at the end of time. You know, frequently when you hear people talking about the end of time, they will throw out terms such as the rapture and the antichrist and the great tribulation and Armageddon. For the next several moments, we want to discuss the end of the world and we want to see what the Bible actually has to say about these subjects. All right, point number one, let's talk about the end of time. Some people will tell you that the end of time is very near and that Jesus is coming soon. Harold Camping and his followers wrote that God has given us in advance of the destruction the exact time of the day of judgment. Some people believe that God has hidden in the pages of Scripture a, a formula which reveals the exact day that Christ will return. Other people are, are more vague. They, they don't necessarily believe that we know the exact day, but they claim to know that the end is very near. They say that there are indicators. There are signs of the times, if you will. Now, if you ask them what these signs are, they will usually say, well, wars and rumors of wars and, and famines and earthquakes, and, and they'll cite Matthew 24, verses 6 and 7. But what about that? Are there signs of the times? Is there a way for us to know that the end is near? Friends, the answer to this question is no. God has not given us indicators. He has not given us any signs to tell us the end is near. In fact, I want you to listen to Matthew 24 and verse 36. God is very clear about this. He says, but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Now that's interesting. The Bible says that the angels do not even know when the day of judgment will be. Mark chapter 13 and verse 32 mentions the fact that Christ Himself did not know when the end would be, at, at least during the time that He was in His fleshly existence on this earth. Now, that's interesting to me that the Lord says the angels do not know. Christ Himself did not know the day of His return. And yet we have people on this earth who think that they can figure it out. Peter tells us that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night, 2 Peter 3 and verse 10. Now, what's the point of that? What does it mean that he will come like a thief in the night? Now, the point is that a thief doesn't give you a clue. He, he doesn't indicate when he's coming. He doesn't say that it's going to be at nighttime. He doesn't say it's going to be raining. It's going to be in the month of October. The fact is, it will be an absolute surprise. You will not be expecting it. And that's the point that the Lord is making. He has not given us indicators or signs of when he will come again. You know, it's interesting because if you search the internet, you'll see that people have been predicting the end of time, it seems like, from the beginning of time. But Harold Camping didn't get it right. He didn't know, and neither does anyone else. Friends, when will people simply believe the Bible? Of that day and hour, no one knows. No, not the angels in heaven, but my Father only. And, and so what about these things that people think are signs of the end. Friends, the fact of the matter is, these things have always been with us. 
When in history have there not been wars and earthquakes? You see, people are taking some scriptures that are pulled out of context, that, that apply to something different, and they are misapplying them to try to predict the end of time. The fact of the matter is God has not given us indicators telling us that the end is near. We do not know. We have no signs telling us that Jesus is coming soon. All right, point number two. Let's talk about the rapture. Now you may say, well, what's the rapture? The supposed rapture is an event that's supposedly going to take place in the future in which those who are faithful to God will be secretly called away into heaven. They will be caught up into heaven while the rest of the world is left behind. In fact, that's where the name of the book and the name of the movie comes from, the idea that we will be left behind. Those who miss the rapture, the supposed rapture, they will be left on this planet to deal with what follows. In fact, I want to read you the description from the Left Behind movie website. It says this, The most important event in the history of mankind is happening right now. In the blink of an eye, the biblical rapture strikes the world. Millions of people disappear without a trace. All that remains are their clothes and their belongings. And in an instant, terror and chaos spread around the world. The vanishings caused unmanned vehicles to crash and burn. Planes fall from the sky. Emergency forces everywhere are, are devastated. Gridlock, riots, and looting overrun the cities. There is no one to help or provide answers. In a moment, the entire planet is plunged into darkness. And so that's how they describe this event, the rapture. In fact, maybe you've been driving down the street and you have seen a bumper sticker on a car that says, warning, in case of rapture, this car will be unmanned. And, and so the idea is that here's a car driving down the street and, and the driver of the car is raptured. He's gone and so the car crashes. And, and the idea is there will be airplanes that will be flying and passengers will just disappear. Perhaps the, the pilot will disappear and the airplane will crash and burn. There will be buses driving down the street and, and mysteriously the, the driver will be gone. And so hundreds of thousands of people around the world are suddenly just going to vanish. At least that's the theory of the rapture. In fact, I want you to listen to, to this man's description of the rapture. This is from a man named Peter Ruckman. He did a lecture on the rapture, which was later put into a, a book form. He says this, he says, the Lord is going to come and a bunch of people are going to go out. If he were to come in the next five minutes, there would probably be some people still sitting here, maybe two or three over here and two or three over there. He says, you would probably lose your mind because it would be so unreal you couldn't grasp it. One minute, you're sitting here looking at a man preach, and then he says, and the next minute, the pulpit's empty, and there is blood coming off the platform. One minute, you're looking at someone's head in front of you, and the next minute, you can see all the way down to the front row. He says, and there would be piles of clothes all over the benches, and about 50 gallons of blood coming down that carpet. Friends, I don't know where he gets any of this because none of this is in the Bible. And this idea that Christ is coming at some point in the future, at which time he will secretly rapture the faithful Christians who are living on this earth, I guess it makes for an interesting movie, but it's not what the Bible says. Well, what does the Bible say? That's what we care about. First, Nowhere does the Bible teach the concept of a secret coming of Christ, a secret appearance of Christ, where Christians will be secretly raptured away. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 describes for us the second coming of Christ, but it describes it very differently. Listen to this, 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 16, the Bible says, For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, now listen to that, and with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord." Now friends, that certainly doesn't sound like a secret coming of Christ. What we have is a, a shout and the trumpet of God. The world is going to be aware of this. There's nothing secret about it. In addition to this, Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7 indicates that not only will the trumpet of God be sounding, but when the Lord comes again, the Bible says, every eye shall see Him. 
Again, that doesn't sound like a secret. Okay, a second key problem with the rapture theory is that it teaches that the living and the dead saints will be raptured away to heaven while the rest of the world will be left behind on this earth for years to come. Now the problem is, the Bible plainly teaches us that both the righteous and the wicked will be resurrected at the same hour. Listen to this. This is John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29. Jesus said, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming, and which all... Now listen, the hour is coming in which all that are in the graves will hear His voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. And so, friends, the Bible says that all of humanity, both good and bad, will be resurrected at the same time. Listen to this, Acts 24 and verse 15, the Apostle Paul said, I have hope in God, which they themselves also accept, that there will be a resurrection of the dead. Now listen to this, not multiple resurrections, a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. The Bible says there will be a resurrection, both the just and the unjust will be involved in this. In Matthew 13 and verse 30, in the parable of the tares, Jesus teaches us that there is no separation of the evil and the good until the very end. The books of 1st and 2nd Thessalonians were written to discuss one major point, and that is the coming of the Lord. And yet, not one single time in those eight chapters do we ever read about there being more than one coming of the Savior. Friends, when the Lord comes again, listen to me, when the Lord comes again, no one will be left behind. No one will be left behind. Within the matter of minutes, everyone will be called before the throne of God for judgment. 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. A third key problem with the left-behind theory is that when the end does come, there will be no world upon which to be left behind. Listen to this. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10 says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with a fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Friends, the idea that the Lord is going to rapture some individuals and the rest of us will be left here cannot be. It's impossible. There will be no world for us to be left upon. There will be no secret coming of the Lord. There will be no rapture of the saints. There will be no signs or advance warning that the end is near. The Bible simply says that at some unknown point in the future, the trumpet of God will sound and the judgment day will commence. And on that day, the earth will be destroyed, and the righteous and the wicked will stand before God to receive their eternal reward or sentence. Friends, no one will be left behind. The doctrine of the rapture is a false one. Now, maybe someone who believes in the rapture would say, well, if, if there's no such thing as the rapture, where the righteous are taken and the wicked are left, then what does Matthew 24, 40 mean? Let me read you that passage. It says, Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken, and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken, and the other left. Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. Matthew 24, 40 through 42. Now, in light of the passages that we have already read, such as John 5, 28, 29, the Bible teaches that there will be one day of judgment and that all of humanity, both good and evil, will be resurrected within the time frame of no more than one hour. One resurrection, all within one hour. But you see, the doctrine of the rapture teaches that the righteous will be called up years before the unrighteous. This passage in Matthew doesn't say that. The doctrine of the rapture would have the unrighteous left behind to go on with life and endure trials and, and sufferings. This passage in Matthew doesn't say anything like that. 
You know, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17 tells us the dead in Christ will rise first, then the living saints will be caught up to meet them in the air. We learn from that passage that there's going to be an order to things. It's all going to be done in one day. John chapter 5 says it's going to be done in one hour. But we learn that there is an order. All that Matthew 24, 40 is describing for us is the gathering of the righteous in that day. It tells us they will go before the wicked. Not that it's going to be years separating them. Simply, they will go first. All right, number three. What happens to those who are left behind? Well, this is a natural question. If, as the movie says, the righteous are going to be caught away to heaven and the rest of the world is going to be left behind, we can't help but wonder what's going to happen to those people who are left behind. Well, since none of this is in the Bible, there are varying explanations as to what's supposedly going to happen. But I'm going to give you kind of a generic summary of what most people would say. This is kind of a general consensus. Again, none of this is from the Bible. At the rapture, supposedly all of the saints are going to be taken to heaven for a period of seven years. During this seven years, they would say that the judgment of the saints is going to take place and these saints will be given their appropriate reward and, and the assigning of their appropriate positions. Now back on the earth, they would say it's going to be a very different story. On the earth during these seven years, several things are supposedly going to happen. First of all, all of the Jews are going to return to Jerusalem and Israel, and the Old Testament temple will be rebuilt. Now they say that's going to happen during the first three and a half years. Secondly, there is going to arise a powerful world ruler that they would identify as the Antichrist. Now, there have been all sorts of theories about this Antichrist and who he supposedly is. Through the years, there have been guesses such as Mussolini. Some have said Hitler is the Antichrist. Some have identified Joseph Stalin, Khrushchev, Fidel Castro, Henry Kissinger, Saddam Hussein. And, and if you search the internet presently, there are lots of people who will say that Barack Obama is the Antichrist. Anyway, the Antichrist is supposedly going to make a covenant with the Jews to guarantee their safety. After three and a half years into this seven-year period, the Antichrist will be revealed for who he truly is, and then he will begin to persecute believers in Christ. He will break his covenant with Israel, and then the Antichrist will enthrone himself in the rebuilt temple in Jerusalem and demand to be worshipped as a god. Anyone who's converted during this period is, is referred to as a, a tribulation saint. And they say that those converts will be persecuted severely. Now, I, I don't want to get bogged down in all of the details right now, but, but uh, let's keep in mind the big picture. The saints have supposedly been raptured to heaven, and the rest of the world is still here on this earth, and it's going to be bad. And, in fact, really bad. In fact, they would describe this as the Great Tribulation. It's supposedly going to be the worst, most intense suffering and persecution that this world has ever known. Now again, none of this is in the Bible, though it's taught by many denominations. Friends, the fact is, it's purely fiction. Now somebody says, if it's purely fiction, then from where do they get it? Where, where does this concept of the Great Tribulation come from? Well, they get it from Matthew chapter 24 and the description of the destruction of Jerusalem. Matthew 24 and verse 21 says, For then shall be great tribulation. But I want you to notice, the Bible doesn't describe this as something that will happen at the end of time. Rather, it is a description of the intense suffering that would take place when the Roman armies attacked Jerusalem in 70 AD. This is not an end time description, it's something from the past. In fact, if you will read Matthew chapter 24, after describing this attack and the destruction of the city of Jerusalem, Jesus says in Matthew 24, 34, Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away, now listen to this, till all these things take place. He says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. What does the Lord say? He says, I have described some things about the destruction of Jerusalem. It involves some tribulation. He says, but this is going to take place before the end of this 
generation. You see, this is tribulation from the past, not from the future. Jesus tells us this would happen within their generation, not the end of time. And history tells us that about 40 years after Jesus makes these remarks, it happened just as He described. Rome attacked Jerusalem, and the suffering, the tribulation was intense. All right, back to the theory that the saints are in heaven, and the rest of the world is, is on the earth suffering persecution and, and tribulation from the Antichrist and, and from his armies. They believe that all of this suffering, this, this great tribulation, is going to culminate with a great battle of the forces of good and evil. They call this battle the Battle of Armageddon. In fact, let me read you Hal Lindsey's description of the uh, Battle of Armageddon from his very famous book, The Late Great Planet Earth. And again, this is one person's rendering. This is one person's opinion. Uh, there are apparently many different descriptions of how this supposed battle is going to take place. Anyway, he believes that two massive armies will meet on an ancient battlefield in Israel known as Armageddon, where the final battle for control of this world will take place. Now, here's how he describes the scene. He says, so here it is, the last great conflict. After the Antichrist assembles the forces of the rest of the whole world together, they meet the onrushing charge of the kings of the east in a battle line which will extend throughout Israel with the vortex centered at the valley of Megiddo. He says that there will be so many who will be killed, he says, that blood will stand to the horses' bridles for a distance of 200 miles northward and southward of Jerusalem. In fact, he says that the war will spread all over the earth, destroying cities like London and Paris and New York. And then he says, As the Battle of Armageddon reaches its awful climax, and it appears that all life will be destroyed on the earth, in that very moment, he says, Jesus Christ will return, and He will save man from self-extinction. Now friends, let's ask this question. Does it matter? Maybe you've been watching this video and you're thinking to yourself, okay, we don't know when Christ will return and, and there's no scriptural evidence for the rapture and, and so what if the Great Tribulation is, is a total concoction? What difference does it really make? Is this really a matter of eternal consequence? Friends, the doctrine of the rapture contradicts what the Bible says about the Day of Judgment. Now that makes it extremely serious. In fact, in 2 Peter chapter 3, Peter talks about the final day, about the Day of Judgment. But in the previous chapter, in chapter 2, just before launching into that discussion, Peter tells us that there are and will be false teachers who bring in destructive heresies, chapter 2 and verse 1. Friends, those who teach the false doctrine of the rapture are just such teachers as Peter is describing. You know, the book of Revelation talks to us about the end of time. And then the Lord tells us near the end of the book, He says, I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away His share in the tree of life and in the holy city which are described in this book. Revelation 22, 18 and following. In light of these things, this doctrine is extremely serious. Friends, the fact of the matter is we don't know when the Lord is coming again. The Bible says of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. But you see, we don't know when that will be. We don't know when the Lord will return. But we do know this. When the Lord does return, it will not be to take the righteous only. Friends, all of humanity will be resurrected on that day to stand before God in judgment. And no one will be left behind.
World Video Bible School has additional Bible-based resources, including hundreds of video programs on various topics that are available free online or for purchasing on DVD. These programs, along with other print and audio materials, are available at wvbs.org.